Hi, everybody. And guess who is with us today? It's Dr. Stephanie Atkinson Alston, um, who is fondly called Dr. A. Hi, Dr. Stephanie. Hey, Ms. Doa, how are you? I'm good. Thank you so much. And just to give an idea for um, uh, your audience who have not met you before, Dr. Stephanie brings over 20 years of experience to coaching that was developed through her service in the military, private and public education training settings. Prior to her career in higher education leadership, Dr. Atkinson Alston had a full career in the United States Navy and earned her the designation as a master training specialist. Her passion for coaching is in helping others to achieve their goals through developing robust resources via courageous conversations, meaningful discovery of self, and identifying their purpose. Dr. Atkinson Alston earned her certificate in evidence-based coaching and doctorate in education and leadership of higher education systems from Fielding Graduate University, Santa Barbara, California, and her skill set allows her to effectively coach in a variety of industries. Dr. Atkinson Alston was recently featured on ABC, NBC, Fox, CBS News, Daily Herald, and Ask. She is proud to be named 2021 Top 25 Powerful Women to Follow by WOMEL Magazine. And Dr. Atkinson Alston is also a number one international best-selling author. We are so thrilled to have you on board today, Dr. A. It's my pleasure, Ms. Doa. Thank you for being here. And I'm sure there are a lot of questions your audience want to ask you. Um, and uh, let's get started with this one. And what does coaching practice mean? A coaching practice for me means a systematic approach to where the client drives the agenda. Um, there's a collaboration between the client and the coach. It's a partnership to um, establish what are clear goals and strategies, all driven by the client and supported by the coach. And collaborating with the necessary steps and actions that need to take place in order for the client to achieve their goals and aspirations. You know, it's a big commitment to understanding the process. There's mm -hmm. a process to everything. I think sometimes folks look at it as um, mentoring, which I always try to clarify is very different. A coach is going to help you deep dive and have courageous conversations about the things that you're trying to do and how do you go about them. Whereas a mentor would typically say, when I was faced with this situation, this is what I do. So here, mm -hmm. follow my roadmap. What I, I, I find is troubling is that every person in situation is a little bit different. And when you have a collaboration and a partnership, the buy-in from the client to follow through is much greater because it means something that's very personal for them. Uh, for me, a coaching practice, you know, it's, system, it's a system, uh, a system of helping folks become more present and in the moment, decluttering their minds from distractions, and just really focusing on that particular session. And so oftentimes it's asked, so what would you like to accomplish today? What's your agenda? A question as a coach, you may ask the client and they'll tell you. Sometimes there's just one thing, sometimes several things. And if there's more than one thing, it's like, let's prioritize. Which one of these really can we work on today? And uh, really teaching them how to be present and in the moment, it's huge because they can take that to other aspects of their life, not just the coaching session. Um, and selling themselves down and really being able to focus. Um, and I always look at every individual a little bit different. Mm. Some folks like having that few minutes as we start the session to settle in and others are like, okay, no, let's just get to it. <laughs> and that's fine too. That's fine. But at least I'm extending to them an opportunity to, to be, be settled, be focused, be grounded so we can um, do the work that's at hand. 
So that's that's why I, I think of a, a coaching practice. Wow. And decluttering their minds from distractions. Oh boy, this is big, especially like, you know, in these days, what kind of like, you know, magical tip would you offer our audience, whether they're a coach or whether they're a, tra- a coachy or like, you know, a learner, what's the big thing that you can, you know, suggest they do so that they can actually declutter their minds while they're in the session, Dr. A. Right. Typically I start out with, um, having them to relax. And sometimes people don't know how to relax. And I found this very useful while I was teaching. I had a class that was right in between the end of the morning and the beginning of the afternoon session. And my students would come in and they were just either just coming to campus or they were just grabbing some lunch or something in between classes and then coming to my class. I was like, you know, we, 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 we can't learn this way. So I told them to put everything down um, put their feet on the ground, um, be still, and whichever um, makes them feel most comfortable. So that could be closing their eyes. It could just, it, it may not, whatever is comfortable for them, you know, placing their hands in a relaxed position, usually on the on the top of your, your thigh. Um, try to avoid the closed uh, kind of arm gestures that we have, because they need to be open. And just having them take a few deep breaths and relax and then me guiding them through not thinking about what they just did what they have to do but just relax and breathe and then helping them relax like from th- their head all the way down to their feet and having them feel their feet grounded um and this caught on <laughs> i had students if i just you know was at the the lecture and just started to begin uh, the, excuse me, are we going to like close our eyes today? <laughs> <laughs> um, because, because a lot of them had never taken just that moment and it's just something yeah, you do in just a couple so of true. minutes. And um, I extend that to folks that are going like for job interviews to kind of relax themselves, be present in the moment. I'm uh, working with a, a women's group and they happen to be reading one of my books and I started it out because this is what I want to teach folks because you're able to open your mind up and have those deep dives, those courageous conversations uh, through the probing questions. But if you're distracted, it's, it's almost impossible. hundred percent. I mean, that's why, like, I was really like, when you said declutter your mind and relax, like I, this is so big, how many people actually realize before they just forge into the learners, you know, mindset, whatever they need to give them this couple, these couple of minutes to switch and to take it easy and to start opening up their mind. This is huge. Um, well, Dr. A, you've had many experiences in life and you've met a lot of diverse people all around the world, um, as well as like, you know, many high level positions, people in high level positions of influence. So what made you choose this field of work in leadership coaching? Well, I chose this and it maybe had chosen me, but I didn't have a, a title or a name to it. So over the years, people would ask me to help them with um, either writing or reviewing their resumes, cover letters. They were going to go on job interviews. What kind of questions might they be asked? Um, even just how to navigate the workplace. Um, so I have been doing that for a number of years. And so when I went to uh, pursue my doctorate, so when I finished, there was an invitation to attend an information session about an evidence coaching project, a uh, program rather. So I, I listened to it and I was further intrigued that one could be paid for what I was already doing over the number of years, but to hone those skills and understand that evidence co- based coaching is both an art and a science. And that part I I really like. So the scientific approach from the psychology um, and then the art, how do you navigate working with your clients um, through establishing that partnership and coming in with the strategies and the follow through. So for me, that was my aha moment that I could actually make money for doing things that I have been doing for a number of years. Yeah. So yeah, that, and 
as important were the faculty members that I trained with. They were what we call more seasoned, mature folks, and their mindsets and their minds were so sharp and they were so in tuned. I thought, okay, when I grow up, I want to be like that. <laughs> Inspiring. <laughs> yeah, amazing. <laughs> exactly. And like what you said about evidence-based coaching is really amazing because you will run into a lot of people who who think will have, you know, like their own perception of coaching. Is it like, you know, really effective? If it's effective, is it going to be effective with me? And when you say like evidence-based coaching, that's an attention grabber already. And and that takes me to to one thing to ask you, what is it that makes coaching real and something which has a real impact to whoever the learning the learner is? I think coaching, sometimes I, I look at it and I think about situational leadership and then that practice or that mindset, every person in situation is a little bit different in what they need. And so one of the four aspects of situational leadership is coaching. So I use the analogy of sports. So for example, if you play softball or baseball and your batting is not very good. And so your coach will offer you some suggestions to improve your batting. So if the coach made an observation that you were swinging too late as the ball covers or crosses the plate, they may suggest to you to stand up in the batter's box so that in the forward part of the box so that you could hit the ball at a better uh, with better timing. And if the player takes that coach's recommendations and follows through the likelihood is a next time or two up to bat they are going to connect and hit the hit the ball so if you look at the evidence-based coaching what's the observation that as you're asking courageous questions and um, having those conversations or let me say like probing questions that leads the client to achieve their goals but we, we always work in a partnership to establish what those goals are and those strategies and always asking for permission from the client to make a suggestion or reference and so what makes it real as the client going through the process and it is a process they understand their ownership to the solutions or the necessary steps and strategies that are needed for them to be successful. And, and, and it's, it's very real. Um, I have a number of, of folks that would say either they've read my book, they also have some kind of step-by-step -step actions that they can take or the one-on-one -on -one or small group coaching that they hadn't realized or recognized a lot of things. And I'll give you a, a, a quick example. Yes, please. The young lady was to totally miserable at work. And we found it was not so much the work, but it was the person that she reported to. And how could she diplomatically kind of share that information? Or was she really aimed at moving to another job? So as we went through the steps and the discovery, it was like, I know I'd like to have another job. I don't know what it is. So, you know, we went through the whole process of saying, okay, so what are the things that that you want to do or you do, or you feel that you're good at. And we came up with a job description without a title. So oh it was like, God. now you need to, now you need to look for those types of jobs that have the things that you've listed. So she went on to apply for a job and didn't feel like she could do it at all. But because we had gone through the steps in the process and I'd done some mark interviewing, she was able to um, acquire that job and she still still there and very happy and very productive. So it's real, but it's real based on the commitment and the energy the client has to follow through with the steps and strategies that we collaborate to set out to, to accomplish. Wow, this is more like reverse engineering. So it's like actually understanding where they want to, what they want to get to and then giving it a name. Right. In that particular instance, yes. Yeah. 
that's beautiful. Uh, how can someone like coaching involves change and change will from one person to the other, the pace will vary and the person's perception will vary. And there's a lot of self-doubt that can be involved with in any coaching process from the learner's side. So how is it, how could it be possible? How can you help your coachee or client to become aware that change is actually happening, especially Dr. A, when the change is slow? How can you make them become aware that there are results happening? Yes, I think we always a reward or compliment or recognize the small rewards and reflect back on those. And so I had a, a client that had just received CPA status and wanted to become an entrepreneur. So, you know, we went through the steps in regards to what was their marketing material, who was their audience, and he wanted to do a neighborhood approach and he wanted to work with small businesses. And so we, we thought about that. So we put together uh, a flyer or announcement that was really good that he could deliver. So as we continue to work, one of the things is he wanted to introduce himself and his business by knocking on folks' doors. And so we, you know, set the time frames so in the next two weeks, how many doors are you going to knock on? And you know, he gave me a number. Okay, fine. We'll um, connect again in a couple of weeks. So the first thing in that session was, how did things go? And he told me, I couldn't even get out of my car to go knock on doors. So we need to take a moment and figure out what path he was going to take. And so that path was, do you go back out and try it again? And if you just knock on one door? Or let me ask you a question. And sometimes these questions are very, they're beyond thought provoking. They can be very emotional. For him, the question was, what else is going on? So there's something that's not, I mean, we all have a fear of public speaking, meeting new people, things of that nature. But we usually we can take that one step forward and we can kind of start working ourselves through it. So he told me he had the fear of rejection. And Very so we common. kept, so therefore we needed to figure out what was the best strategy for him to move forward. And with his permission, I suggested maybe you need to do psychological or emotional type of counseling. And maybe you need to step away from coaching just for a moment so you can get a handle on that. Sometimes people can do work on two different things at a time, um, but it was, it was all up to him. So that goes into, you know, I, 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 I told him, well, you, you have a great fly. You have a go great way of doing this. Well, maybe it, knocking on doors isn't for you. Maybe you do mailers and you do follow-ups for calls, things of that nature, but always asking for that permission um, and just, you know, reflect back, you know, you have a good product, you have a good marketing strategy, you, just, you need to follow through, but if it's not for you at the moment, it's understandable. Well, handling it in that way has a lot of compassion too. And of course, like it could have several reactions. So he may be in, you know, triggered to actually go ahead and knock doors, or <laughs> maybe he's going to think of other solutions and based on what I understand doctor is that you will let him as a client lead is that right did I get that right correct and I, I never offer uh, suggestions or recommendations without permission wow yeah. that's amazing this, this is this is effective. their journey this is their what they're trying to achieve yes because I think people really appreciate you believing in them and that they have something within them to help them solve their problems. They just need to be guided in a way. But this way, the client takes ownership. Exactly. You can hold them up to what they just said, what they just, you know, are committing to. Correct. That's amazing. Uh, now, this is for people who are actually coachable. Now, I'm going to ask you a hard one that's always on my mind. 
So what is a situation where you decide that a person is uncoachable? It does happen periodically, not frequently, but <laughs> what what I've what I've found is, you know, someone reaches out and says, you know, I have this situation um in or a problem and I want to try to work myself through it. Um, can you help? And so I had a mid manager who wanted to be promoted and was a little leery about the promotion because they didn't have a strong background in that area in which they were pursuing. And so I said, well, we we can, you know, we can walk, walk through that. So, you know, the agreement is you lay out everything that you as a coach are going to do. And as what the person who's being coached is going to be held accountable for. Well, when they got that, they were like, no, I think I want more of a mentor. They didn't want to reflect back. They had been successful in my, my, my opinion or observation. They didn't want to take those experiences and apply them to new experiences. They just were not willing to do the work. So I shared with them that I'm not a mentor. <laughs> I'm a coach. So perhaps they needed to seek someone who would mentor them and tell them, you know, when I was in that situation, this is what I did, or this is exactly how I prioritize my work day, things of that nature. And that is where there is a huge, vast difference between mentoring and coaching. Absolutely. And and when you think this person does not want to do the work, because this is exactly the crux of it, does that mean they do not want to do the reflection? They don't want to do the um, thought they would don't want to go through the entire thought process. Which part is the weakest part in that in that kind of reaction? I think it is going through the process. Um, when you go through the process, you may uncover some things, reflect on some things that you hadn't reflected upon some past experiences that were negative or hurtful or harmful. And in those um, conversations, that's what we call them courageous conversations. Are you willing to have this conversation? You know, I, I can lay out for you. Here's a couple different paths. We can take this path that may appear to be a little bit easier for you, or we may go dive deep. And are you okay with that? In which I've had many clients want to do the deep dive. They sometimes become very emotional, but they have a, a, a discovery or a rediscovery of what that trigger is for them or why they do what they do or don't do what they would like to do, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. You know, they're really becoming more self-aware and what drives them or has them to hold back, if you will. So I really think it's the process, understanding the process and being willing to go through the process. But what I often tell folks, you know, it, the choice is theirs. If we want to kind of go down this kind of easy path, or do you really want to find out what is at the foundation of your hesitancy um, to move forward? Is, is it the real you know, I let them decide. Change? Is it the real desire for change, Dr. A? Is it that they have in that, in, in which case we're in situations where somebody comes to you and actually asks for help, that's the level of awareness right there. But then when they get started with the process, you find huge resistance. Is it that this kind of situation, this person did not hit bottom rock so hard that they're still okay with not changing? that's a that's a very good question and I would have to say I don't think that they really bought into the process because this is part of the process hmm. change if you follow the process there's going to be change there will be an outcome and hmm. you are the driver of that change so 
you know, I, I work with a number of clients that go so far and they go, oh, okay, I think I got it. And <laughs> they go out and they're not as successful as they could have been. Okay, no problem. <laughs> but, you know, um, it's still, it's still client driven. What mm. is it that you want? How much energy and effort are you willing to put into a, a reaching your goals? And then I always let people know your goals can change. Yeah. They don't have to be, absolutely. you know, and, and that's okay. And then one has to define what sex success look like for them as mm. an individual, not to be pushed by society your company, your business, or your family, but what does success look like for you? Hmm. That's the biggest motivator. So is it the commitment part to the process? I I would say yes. Because if you're really committed to something, you will follow through. Yeah. And even if you hit a roadblock, you'll have that discussion about what that roadblock is. And we can figure out uh, alternative approaches to that. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's it's really commitment to the process that involves the energy. You know, how excited are you about doing X, Y, and Z? Mm -hmm. So Could be committed so sometimes to the I'd goal. Say, I think it's commitment to the process, yeah. which will help you reach your goal. What about if it's a pseudo goal? It's not their real goal. You think that could be another reason why they're not really bought into the process? Not too often, but it could be possibly that. Um, but then that's why, you know, we try to do the, the, the smart goals, yeah. the specific, the measurable, the attainable, the realistic, and the timely Um to see, is this really a goal or is this not, is this just like this huge aspiration that you have somewhere, but you, you're, you'll never attain it or you're going to mm. have to go through a lot of steps to get there. Mm. So, yes. Well, how, how do you do this? How do you, how do you actually, how can you actually tell if this is the client's real goal or whether this is like the manufactured goal that everybody around them you know, sort of brainwash them into? What are the signs? If By I simply asking that question. <laughs> well, it's, I, I typically will just ask that question because yeah. you'll hear gold and, and, you know, as we said, coming lo lofty and having them evaluate it mm -hmm. realistically and in the moment, sometimes folks will say, well, that's what my parents wanted me to do. Oh. Um, they wanted me to, you know, go to college and be a doctor, but I hate blood, <laughs> you know, those types of things. Yeah. So it's like, so, so what does your success look like? So is it important for your family for you to become a doctor or is it important for them that you go to school and you have a career that you're passionate about and you really, really enjoy? And oftentimes I'll say, I think that I complete my education and I go out and I get a meaningful job. Mm. But yeah, sometimes I'll just ask the question. As simple you know. as it is. Yeah. 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 Sim sim sometimes simple is, you know, actually a real trigger for people to just respond again in a simple way and actually say the whole thing. What is like from from everything that you know about coaching people and your own experience with coaching people, is there a kind of standard success ratio that people will change after coaching that we can lean on when we're talking to people? Oh, definitely. So what I've observed are probably 80 to 99% of the folks have changed. Wow, that's massive. Through the, th through the process, they have changed. Now they approach similar situations with this foundation that I can be successful. If I buy into the process, I continue to follow the process, I, I, I can be successful. And, and those who are not, it's because they, they didn't really brought into the process the understanding that there is a process to everything that we do and understanding that there's uh, work that they have to do 
and following the steps and the process. So those are successful. They It's like that aha moment, the light bulb comes on and they do those things and they are successful. And that reminds you reminds me of what you said previously when they are actually coached to live in the present without actually like worrying about like anything they're holding to in the past, especially their self-image or their expectations, which is going to drain a lot of energy from the current and present, you know, storage or reserve. Correct. Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, it's massive. 80% to 99% is so, I mean, encouraging to anybody who has any kind of self-doubt, unless they think they're going to be coming, you know, from the 1%. <laughs> uh, so, uh, <laughs> so um, coaching people takes a lot of energy, Dr. A, and everybody's, everyone is going to be coming and having their own scenarios. Some scenarios are really um, deep, draining, complicated. Some of them are simpler. Some are more complex. And it takes a lot of mental power and energy to actually be involved with people every day, help them out of where they are to another level of awareness and energy. How do you retain and restore your energy in order to manage influencing people, especially that you are coaching people from different age brackets, which makes it even, you know, I mean, needs more qualifications. So how would you actually be able to retain and restore your energy to keep moving every day? Okay. So I refer to myself as a person having old school knowledge proven success and a good work ethic and new school energy um, because I'm open-minded to different thoughts and approaches. And so for myself, it can be very draining. Some of your clients can be very emotionally and physically draining. Because what I do is I simply shut things down. I go offline. I regroup and I refresh. I re-energize. And I practice being in the moment through prayer and meditation so that I can reflect, I can be present and in the moment and where I can find a place of peace. Therefore, then I have the renewed energy to go back out and to help others achieve their goals and their dreams. Wow. Sometimes I just shut it down. Sometimes I just shut it down. You have to. I mean, it's just, it's just so busy around you, you know, so... You have to take care of yourself before you can take care of others. So I think true. that's one of the things that a lot of people are recognizing. You have nothing left if you've mm -hmm. given it for yourself, if you've given it to others. Yeah. So. Yeah. Being a role model. Absolutely. And uh, what is the dream that you know that you will manifest, Dr. A? In your lifetime? Well, one of the dreams... <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So I'm currently living my dream of semi-retirement. Um, and uh, I'm living a purposeful, purposeful life led by my passion to help others. And so my ultimate dream is that I will manifest to leave a legacy for my niece. Oh. Tell us about your legacy. If you'd like to share that with us. Well, yeah. Well, my, my passion to help others. And to, uh, of course, monetarily benefit, which then could be passed on to my niece. What is your, I know that coaching is part of it as per our conversation, but what is your real passion? I mean, where does that coaching um, mission come from, Dr. Ape? Which passion is it that drives you to having this immense, you know, uh, joy when you're coaching people. Right. So as you said, my, my real passion is in helping others. And it's through my own personal observations, experiences, which not all were good to allow those things for me to share with others so that they don't have to go through the same 
school of hard knocks, if you will, um, to let them know that there is a way out, there's a way up. Um, so it, it's just my passion to help other people. So whether I do it in my um, in my book, through my books, or if I do it on in, in coaching like a one-on-one -on -one or a small, small group, um, just to help other people. I mean, why should someone have to go through what I went through if they they don't have to? Yeah, um, I have to share that with folks. So yeah, because some of the things that, that I've encountered were not very pretty at all, but I reflect upon them and figure out how can I use that situation or those situations to help others. So that's that's just my passion, you know, taking my experiences and observations and sharing them with others. Um, it's, it's it as you can see, I typically light up when I start talking about my passion, which is coaching. And, and what does it mean for you to see that kind of transformation happen? What does it mean to you? It means that the goal that I set out has been accomplished through them. So that's 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 very just um, it's joyful and the deepest um, sense of the word. It's heartfelt mm. to see others be successful. Absolutely. And especially like these days, leadership and um, self-leadership. What does it mean to the world right now, Dr. A? It's in dire need of a growth mindset. I have been speaking to a few college presidents and they agree that we, we can't just develop leadership. We have to grow leaders mm -hmm. and they have to grow from a very good foundation um, from which coaching can provide. And then in turn, they use those similar strategies with their teams. So you're growing a, a mindset of folks that are not um, those who are hesitant. So uh, that that's huge, a growth mindset in, in leadership.